Okay, so I can hear the bells from noon, from 12 o'clock. So I think that we can, we can start now the, the seminar. Uh, welcome to you all. Uh, my name is Anna Mai, and I'm the Head of Communication and Outreach of the IGMA, the Institute of Material Science of Barcelona. And I'm very happy today to welcome you all to this IGMAP online seminar. Uh, with me, we have here today Xavier Obrados, who is the IGMAP di director, and he will host today's speakers, with, uh, which is uh, David Amabilino. So thank you, David, for being here. David is from the University of Nottingham, and, and he will give us the seminar entitled From Soft Materials to Complex Material Systems. Xavier Obrados will make a, a longer presentation for him. Here we have okay. also uh, Joan Figuerola, who is the head of IT, uh, to make sure everything runs smoothly during the seminar. Uh, I only wanted to tell all our attendees, as you already know, maybe now, that well, the seminar will last around 45 minutes or so, and then we will have like 10, 15 minutes to chat with David and ask him questions, with which we encourage you, you to do so. And you can ask uh, questions in the questions and answer icon uh, under, the, under your, your screen or also using the chat. So we will ask questions using, using this system. So now, uh, Xavier, I let you the word to introduce uh, David to all of us. Have a nice seminar. Okay. Thank you very much, Anna. And of course, uh, thank you to David for accepting to give this uh, seminar for the, all the people of IMAP and uh, all the people who is uh, coming here. So let me uh, describe uh, shortly the, the life of uh, David. David is a, a very uh, well-known and appreciated scientist in uh, IGMAP because he was here for many years and now it's uh, in UK. Let me say first that uh, David Amabilino received uh, a bachelor and a PhD from the University of London. Then he stayed for three years in uh, Birmingham and uh, also as a postdoctoral fellow in the University of uh, Strasbourg with very well known people in the organic chemistry. And then he moved to IGMAP in 1996 as a postdoc, where he became a tenured scientist in 99. And then he stayed here up to uh, 2014, he became before a research professor at uh, 2009. So in 2014, he was appointed as a chair on sustainable chemistry in the School of Chemistry of the University of uh, Nottingham, where he is uh, at present. Uh, he serves as a, in the board of a journal Chirality and uh, associate editor of Chemical Society Review, and he has received uh, several prizes. Uh, David is a uh, specialty is an organic chemist chemist by training. He has been uh, strongly involved in uh, supramolecular chemistry and focusing on the preparation of functional molecules for many applications. And um, he is uh, particularly interested now in materials for energy and dynamic and soft materials, which is mainly the topic of the of, of the talk that he will provide to us uh, today. So thank you very much, uh, David. I'm sure that we will appreciate a lot uh, your talk because we know that you are a very pedagogical profile and uh, you are a professor at universities. I'm sure that all the people who listen to you are very happy to listen to you. Thank you and please go ahead. Thanks very much, Xavier. So no pressure, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's a pleasure to... Uh, to be online with you all today. I'm sorry I can't be in the IGMAB in person. It's a bit of a shame, but uh, anyway, uh, fortunately the technology lets us do all of this now, which is fantastic. So as uh, Anna and Xavier said, I'm gonna to talk to you about soft materials uh, to complex material systems. So I'll give you a bit of background to uh, what we're doing in Nottingham and what work we actually started actually uh, when I was in the IGMAB uh, about gel systems. Uh, first of all, uh, just to show you what the pictures are, this is the Trent building of the University of Nottingham, which is about a few hundred meters from where I am right now. It's not so sunny today, but anyway, uh, <laughs> still a nice building. Uh, and this is the laboratory where my group work, which are the carbon neutral laboratories. So this is a building uh, which was 
finished construction about four years ago and which is carbon neutral over its lifetime. So you can see most of it's made of wood, it's got a nice green uh, roof to it. Um, and this is a view actually in, in the winter, this is ice on here, so that's just quite a nice building. I'm going to talk to you about soft material. So just to um, kind of situate you what I mean by that and what different kinds of soft materials there are. I guess mainly there are three general groups of soft materials liquid crystals, which were actually discovered in the, the 19th century uh, by the melting of cholesterol derivatives. And, and this review here in Chemical Society of Reviews is actually about um, composite materials where gelators are actually mixed with graphene oxide. So uh, there's a whole heap of interesting electronic and optoelectronic properties that you can get uh, from composite uh, liquid crystal systems. The second big group are in gels, and here the example I'm, I'm giving is actually in food. So this is a microscope image of a food stuff, where what you can see here in green, these are oily segments of the food, so it's a kind of a colloid. And in between there, there there's another kind of colloid which holds all of these droplets together. So this could be something like yogurt or something like that, I don't know what it is, um, but it's, it's something like that. It's a composite material uh, with different components, which separate and have a defined texture and flavor. And the, the separation of these flavors really, these areas really determines the flavor and texture that we, we actually taste. And there's a whole science around all of that. Uh, that's a nice introduction, that review there. And then uh, over here, we have uh, polymers. So uh, here's an example of sensors, which actually came out this year. So this is actually printed P.PSS, which is a very well known. Uh, organic conducting polymer and here it's been printed on a soft material which is PDMS which is polydimethyl siloxane uh, which a lot of you will know or if you don't if you look in your bathroom you've got it all around the joints of your ceramics in your bathroom uh, PDMS is a, a soft and malleable material and here it's being used uh, for electronic reasons as a, as a kind of a sensor yeah. so you can see it's completely flexible that kind of device so soft materials are good for a whole range of, of applications but let me talk to you a little bit about gels because gels mean different things to different people. So first of all, uh, a chemical gel is actually where you have a continuous chain of joined up molecules which are joined covalently. So you have a solvent, which could be any kind of solvent, and then this covalent bondly bonded chain, which links with itself and crosses over itself to immobilize the solvent. A physical gel is very similar in the sense that you normally have fibers of colloids joined together, but in this case, you have a molecular gelator which joins together through non covalent interactions. And these fibers can join together, cross over, and separate. But just the same as the chemical gel, they immobilize the solvent. But the properties of these two systems are very different from one another because we see in the chemical gel, these interactions. Are not reversible. So if we heat up that gel, what will probably happen is that the solvent will come out and the gel will contract. On the other hand, in the reversible gel, in the physical gel, as we warm up, we're going to weaken these interactions between the molecules. Uh, you'll make the molecules more soluble and that will probably become a liquid. So you have a gel to sol transition, which is completely reversible in principle. And it's this kind of gel which I'll be uh, talking about today. Uh, if some of you want to see uh, some nice articles on gels, there's two good books by the Royal Society of Chemistry. Uh, molecular gels, and functional molecular gels, um, those cover the area extremely well. Where we're we going now with this work, really, I'll give you the background to it, but where we want to go with it is really to look at material systems where we have supramolecular complexity and diversity. So if we think about complexity and diversity in general, if you think about biological systems, then obviously you have enormous molecular complexity and diversity because you've got all the range of, of lipids, of proteins, uh, nucleic acids, sugars, um, all of those components coming together in a, a tremendous number of different ways. 
and also supramolecular complexity and diversity because they can organize between each other uh, in a multitude of ways as well. If we think about synthetic materials and particularly uh, organic synthetic molecules perhaps, it's arguable you have even more diversity than natural systems because we're not limited to the natural building blocks of sugars, amino acids, uh, and nucleic acids. So here you have a, a huge variety of synthetic chemistry where you can basically join up anything you want. But the supramolecular organization of all of those molecules is less well understood and is a bit more of a challenge. So what we'd really like to do is to take relatively simple synthetic molecules to start with and develop the supramolecular chemistry of those. So to go towards systems that have some kind of property, and we'll see what those are towards the end of the talk. So in Nottingham, we are interested in uh, sustainable chemistry in the building I am, uh, to sustainable chemistry building. So we're interested in using gelated components that are from renewable sources. So that's both, these are the bits and pieces that are gonna go up to make these molecules in blue here in between the solvent and the physical gel. So one I'll talk to da about today is sorbitol, sorbitol derivatives. This is a natural product that's present in a lot of foods and is widely available. Uh, it's in foodstuffs as well. Tartaric acid is one we've used, I won't talk about that today. Cumin aldehyde is an aldehyde which is present in the spice, cumin, uh, we'll be using that. Cinnamaldehyde is another, uh, in cinnamon, another spice derived aldehyde. And then in terms of the solvents, obviously we've got different components in the gel systems. As far as the solvent goes, uh, we'll be using uh, water and ethanol especially, but we could also think about using uh, edible oils, as in foods and so on. You could think about using salt solutions where you have different kinds of metal ions in the solution, or other uh, molecular species in the solution to affect how the gels form, and also mixtures of all of these things, so to go towards. Uh, a, a real systems chemistry. So let's see an example of that then. So uh, this is work done by Glycine, my group, and it was recently published in Soft Matter. So these are benzylidine desorbital derivatives. So here's the sorbitol that I showed you before. And you can take aromatic aldehydes with uh, this sorbitol compound here, and in the presence of acid, that undergoes a reversible reaction where you form a thing called an acetal, which is this thing here. So if you've reacted the aldehyde at this position, that carbon atom is there, and you have the R group hanging off the side here. You can see in this case, there's one aldehyde which has reacted with the sorbitol derivative, and that's, uh, we'll call that MBS, that's monobenzylidine sorbitol. And then just on the right here, you can see that there are have two been reacted. So it's reacting with these two hydroxyl groups here in this case, and that's giving you another derivative coming off the side here, this R group. Uh, again, and that's the dibenzylidine desorbital derivative. So Glyser took different aldehydes with uh, sorbitol. Cumin aldehyde is quite nice because you can prepare both the monobenzylidine sorbitol derivative, this one here with all the hydroxyl groups that are still free, and the dibenzylidine sorbitol derivative here, where you've got two of these uh, groups hanging off there. And you can do that selectively. One thing I should point out actually is that this chemistry is extremely specific. If you look at all of these hydroxyl groups on the compound uh, here, you think that you might get that, al that al uh, aldehyde adding across any of, the, uh, any of these hydroxyl groups. And in fact, it's an extremely specific process because of the stereochemistry of these hydroxyl groups. If you look at these, they're both facing in the same direction of that skeleton there, and that makes it uh, a good orientation to be able to react with this aldehyde. So the chemistry is very specific. In the case of uh, vanillin, which I haven't mentioned so far, another natural product, another aldehyde, uh, here you can prepare the MBS derivative again. And in the case of cinnamaldehyde as well, but here the reactivity doesn't work and we can't prepare the dibenzylidine sorbitol uh, compounds. We were interested though to look at these two derivatives in a way that hasn't been done so much before in combination with one another. But first let's see how they, how these molecules come together and how uh, that might work. So this is a crystal structure of one of those uh, monobenzylidine sorbitol derivatives. It's actually the vanillin one. Here's the aromatic group that comes off the side of the 
of the sorbitol group to here. So that's the R group here. And then these hydroxyl groups, the oxygen atoms are in red. And you can see that there are hydrogen bonds joining up these molecules and they form a kind of a chain in the crystal structure. So this is not a gel, this is a crystal structure. This molecule doesn't actually form a gel, but it gives us an idea of how they come together. And we can check that by infrared spectroscopy. What you also see is the hydrogen atom that's attached to the acetyl carbon atom here is actually forming an interaction with the pi surface of a neighboring aromatic moiety on a neighboring molecule there. So this kind of interaction is almost like a staple that holds those, holds those molecules together and ends up forming a chain. And these hydroxyl units that are left over here that aren't interacting between the neighboring molecules actually interact with molecules in a neighboring chain. So you get this kind of structure here where the orange part are the sugar units, which interact through hydrogen bonds, and then these aromatic units are sticking off the side. And in between these types of molecules, you get interactions between the aromatic units. These are not pi pi sacking interactions, uh, they're CH pi interactions, so they're relatively weak, but nonetheless, you can get stacking interactions there. And this really gives us a clue about how uh, the dibenzylene sorbitol derivatives might also come together because you can think of similar sorts of hydrogen bonds taking place and similar sorts of interactions between the aromatic groups going on. So that's exactly what we wanted to do. We wanted to, to take uh, the monobenzylene sorbitol derivative, which is over here on the right, and the dibenzylene sorbitol derivative, both derived from cuminaldehyde, and to see how a combination would affect their phase behavior in mixtures of water and ethanol. So if we look at the dibenzylene sorbitol derivative first, you can see here we're going from ethanol all the way up to water with different proportions of ethanol and water. So nine to one, ethanol water, up to uh, one to nine, ethanol water. And across that range, all of these, you can, all of these form a gel. The orange color is, is the formation of a gel, but that DBS derivative, you can see is quite hydrophobic. That isn't so soluble in uh, in water, and it doesn't, in fact, go into the solution enough to be able to form a gel or anything that's really discernible at the kind of concentrations we need. If you look at a monobenzylidine sorbitol derivative on its own, then that's completely soluble in ethanol and all the way up to um, 60-40 ethanol water, where it starts to form a non-self-supporting gel. So that normally when we test the gels, we form them and then turn the vial upside down. And if it doesn't move, it's a gel. So uh, these ones tend to flow slightly when you tip the vial. And then when we, we reach three to seven ethanol water, then you start to form the gel. So you can see that we can't form a gel in all of these uh, solvent mixtures with any single component. However, what's interesting is when we take the MBS and DBS derivatives in one-to-one -one ratio, uh, we can actually gel the whole range of water and ethanol using that combination of materials there. and they all form gels. The scanning electron micrographs are really interesting of these materials so you uh, actually see at the two extremes so when you have DBS MBS in pure water you can see there are thicker fibers here and then kind of a spider's web of fibers in between. So it's almost like there's two processes going on there when that gel forms, but nonetheless, it's a, it's a robust gel and it's, uh, it's rheological properties, which I won't show, but which we've done. It's rheological properties are, are totally characteristic of a gel type material. And then at the other extreme, where you have DBS and MBS in pure ethanol, then we also get this kind of effect. I should say that whenever we, I'm showing scanning electron micrographs, like this one, those are actually of things called zero gels. So this is when the solvent's actually been allowed uh, to evaporate from the material. It's a real challenge to see what the structure is within uh, the actual gel while it's solvated. And we'll come back to that a bit later on. There are some techniques you can use, uh, but nonetheless, the zero gels do give you an idea of what's present uh, in the gel itself when it's formed. Well, you can see here, which is really nice, when you have a one-to-one -one mixture of water and ethanol, then you really can't discern two types of fiber there. So despite the fact you've got two different components, the MBS and the DBS, those two are clearly coming together to form 
those ribbons because you, you really can't pick out and even if you look very very carefully and um, we're looking at it here superficially but if you look very very carefully you can't pick out a difference between any of these ribbons so this is like there are lamellae of the dbs or mbs that's stacked on top of one another and you can actually see that by um, powder diffraction x-ray measurements as well so it's it's as if you're forming a layer of one of these components and then another component is coming down as a line on top of that existing one. So it's quite a nice example of where you can use multiple components uh, to get a gel system that wouldn't be available otherwise from them. Let me just have a drink of water. Hmm. Okay. So water and ethanol is actually a very interesting mixture of solvents. So I've, I've taken this graph here from, from this paper down here, and this shows you the excess surface tension as a, as a function of the mole fraction of different alcohols. And you can see that uh, at a certain mole fraction, these are for different alcohols here, so methanol, ethanol, or isopropanol, you get a big change in the surface tension at different mole fractions. And that big difference in the solvent properties is actually reflected across a whole range of properties of that solvent mixture. So it's, it's completely uh, non-linear. And especially when uh, we're introducing up to about uh, 50 uh, mole percent of the alcohol in, uh, in water. Actually, there's an interesting scientific report that came out in 2017. This is actually about whiskey. I don't know why you'd want to do a theoretical study on whiskey, but there you go. Some people did a theoretical study on some of the flavoring compounds in whiskey and looking at how those flavor molecules were distributed within the liquid, depending on the content of alcohol, because some of you might know that you can get cask whiskey where you have a very high percentage of ethanol, about 60%. Uh, when you buy it in the bottle from the uh, from the off license, then it's probably around 40%. And if you're at home and having some, you might want to dilute it with some water uh, to get the flavours a bit more, and that also has an effect on it. And this study actually shows you that depending on the concentration of water and ethanol in that mixture, you can get an excess of ethanol at the surface, as is shown here. So the ethanol waters are shown in the space filling. Uh, form and the water in this in the stick form here so there's more ethanol at the surface here and that affects the flavor that we perceive when we drink uh, that beverage so it's it's a, an effect of the separation of ethanol and water in that mixture uh, that, that's giving you that effect that we, we sense in taste and in fact you can see the effect on on surface tension actually if you take some whiskey so I took this last night um, and you, you get this teardrop effect sometimes when you have whiskey or wine or, or other relatively strong alcoholic beverages, not, not beer because it's too weak in alcohol. But these streaking effects are because of the, the differences in surface tension that you get when you have locally high concentrations of ethanol. So here uh, the liquid tends to streak because uh, when you have high concentrations of ethanol, the uh, liquid flows uh, a lot more readily. So this brings me to using different water ethanol mixtures and looking at its effect on the self-assembly of the molecules. So this is now a, a different gelator. You can see this is a bisimidisodium gelator. This too forms gels in water ethanol. You can see here, this is the vial turned upside down. It doesn't flow at all. It's an opaque gel. If we look at atomic force microscope images, and this was actually done some time ago, so these were actually done in the map. you can see there's uh, lovely fibers which run all the way through the uh, sample there. Although this is zero gel, as I said before, those fibers are immobilized in the gel, they're crossing over and the water and ethanol are trapped in between. And then this image down here is the SEM image. Uh, you can see again here, uh, the fibers, similar, similar result really to the to the AFM in that zero charge. So in general, a good thing to do with, with gels is to do a, a phase diagram of what goes on. So this shows you the phase diagram for that compound at 292 Kelvin. Um, at different concentrations along the uh, horizontal 
line here, so from one millimolar up to 12 millimolar, and at different proportions of water to ethanol here. So from one to one water ethanol to nine to one water ethanol. And you can see the dark red area, which is what I'd like you to focus on really, is where we have the gel being formed. So you can see that at about 7.3 water ethanol, uh, you have the lowest critical gel concentration. And that really coincides with this big change of properties from uh, water to uh, ethanol as you change that ratio. Uh, here is where the gelator is most effective. So apart from doing that, we were quite interested to see um, how we could look at that in a different way. So one characteristic of a, of a gel is to look at the gelation time. So this is, here we're mixing a solution of the gelator in ethanol and adding it to water and then mixing it quickly and then allowing it to stand to form the gel. You'll see that process in a minute. I've got a video to show you how that works. But you can look at the gelation time as a function of the concentration and of course of the solvent mixture. So if we take the 10 millimolar uh, sample, for example, in one-to-one -one water ethanol, you can see the gelation time uh, is quite fast here. And then as you increase the amount of water in the sample compared with ethanol, then that gelation time takes much, much longer. So we were interested to see if we could pick apart the reasons for that. So we just decided to do extinction uh, spectroscopy. So this is basically you doing an absorption spectrometer. And this shows you lots of spectra recorded over time. So the zero time spectrum is down here where I'm indicating with the, with the laser pointer. And then over time, we start to get absorption as fibers start to form in that mixture. And eventually up here, we'll have the, the, the gel being formed when we have a complete network through the through the whole sample and that's scattering the light. So this isn't true absorption, it's actually scattering of light uh, that we're observing with this technique. So when you do that, you take all of those spectra and you can plot some lines. So uh, this would be at one temperature, let's say uh, 300K. And you can see that there's an induction time, a rapid growth of the fibers, and then a saturation point when all of the fibers are grown uh, and they're in principle immobilizing the network there. And you can do that at different temperatures. So this is uh, recorded at 700 nanometers for this uh, particular mixture, but you can do that for all of them. And the interesting thing with this kind of curve is that you can actually fit it to a, a formula, which I'll, I won't go through, but uh, I can tell you about that later on if you'd like to know about it, where you can determine uh, rate constants for the formation of those fibers. So there's a, basically a nucleation rate which determines the length of this period here, and a growth rate, which determines the slope of this line here. So if you do that and you take the rate constants, you can put that into the Iring equation, which looks at the energy of activation of those processes. So what this plot shows you is a plot of the uh, rate constants as a function of the temperature for different solvent mixtures, so let's take this solvent mixture here, the one-to-one -one water ethanol. You can see that as we change time, uh, the rate of the growth process changes with a certain slope. And we determine the thermodynamic properties from that slope, and I'll show you that in a moment. I just want to point out before I show you that, that in the 7-3 solvent mixture, there are actually two slopes. So there's one, uh, which has a negative slope and one with a positive slope that you can see there. And uh, this is quite interesting because remember that the 7-3 mixture is the one that is uh, at this kind of crossover point in the properties of the water ethanol mixture. If you remember that graph of the, uh, of the surface tension, that really happens around this ratio. And this is a volume ratio here, it's not a molar ratio. The nine to one water ethanol mixture is really interesting as well because it actually has two processes. So uh, there's a first step where you start to form small fibers and that has a negative slope here. And then there's a much slower process uh, where we have a positive slope and this is the growth step of the fibers. So let's see what happens in terms of the thermodynamic data we can get out of there. So what this shows you is for the different solvent mixtures, which are shown here and the different steps, 
the enthalpy and entropy of activation of those processes. So you can see that in the one-to-one -one, uh, water ethanol mixture, both uh, enthalpy and entropy uh, are important. Perhaps it's slightly more dom dominated by the entropy of that process. If we now go to the 7.3 water ethanol mixture, you can see that uh, in the A regime, so this is the one here that I indicated to you before with the negative slope, uh, this process is dominated by an unfavorable uh, enthalpic component, whereas at uh, higher temperatures, that is overcome and the entropic uh, component kicks in there. So we're switching between uh, different regimes in terms of thermodynamics simply by changing the temperature in that water ethanol mixture. And then in the nine to one mixture, we're seeing two different regimes as well. The first one again is not favored enthalpically. And then the second one is dominated by a positive uh, entropic contribution to that growth process. So uh, higher temperature, we have a more enthalpic influence on the process, and at a lower temperature, a more entropic one in the case of this 7-3 mixture. So we got this published in Chemical Science, very nice, and this shows you this kind of battle, this arm wrestle between enthalpy and entropy, which doesn't only determine the rate that the fibers formed at, but also uh, changes their morphology. So you can see that here, here are some images um, where you have very thin fibers and more ribbon-like ones, and then the ones formed at higher temperature where you have much smoother, um, flat and broad uh, fibers. And that's also shown in atomic force microscopy. So the ratio of the solvents changes the morphology very much of the fibers. I'll just show here, just maybe to highlight these AFM images of the uh, nine to one uh, gel fibers. You can see there's a very narrow distribution of the fiber width and also of the fiber height. So in fact, we see quite a few fibers that only have a single uh, bilayer. Uh, I'll show you the bilayer in a minute. And then the, the biggest peak here in terms of fiber height is actually just two bilayers uh, of this gelatin material, which I think is quite remarkable. The nice thing is, of course, you can plot for each of the samples how the height uh, changes with the number of layers and you get a nice straight line plot for those. So what I was saying about the bilayer here, actually you can tell from uh, powder diffraction, uh, which is shown here, and it's identical for all solvent mixtures. So that shows we're, we're not getting a difference because of any polymorphism in the sample. It's purely because of the number of stacked layers that we have. So a single layer actually comprises two of these molecules which are interdigitated, as you can see here. So here's the alkyl chain of this molecule, the emitted sodium group, the phenol ring, another emitted sodium group, and the other alkyl chain. And there's another one coming from the other side of the lamella uh, that fills up the space in between there. And the dimensions match, it, match exactly. You get these nice uh, lamellae that are formed. And in the nine to one mixture, I said to you that you have two of these, one stacked on top of the other. And of course, in between, well, we have a bromide counter ion. So um, don't forget that, that we've also got counter ions always around in this emitter sodium uh, case, which is very important for what, what I'll tell you about uh, now. So we realized that this was uh, an interesting opportunity that if we can form these lamellae, in principle, the spaces between the lamellae, we can use them to put different kinds of molecules inside for different reasons. So uh, one of those was uh, porphyrin. So uh, this is a tetraphenyl porphyrin here. Porphyrins are quite interesting for a, for a number of reasons. They're highly colored, as you can see in this picture here. They're nice, nice purple color. Uh, this particular one is soluble in water when you make it as it's sodium salt. So uh, I'll show you in a moment how this is formed. So you dissolve this in uh, water. You combine it with an ethanol solution of that, and you end up with a gel. Uh, that has this nice purple color and has some nice properties as well as well at the moment. It's quite interesting that gelation time actually comes down as we increase the concentration of, of the porphyrin in the water. So you can see here, um, 
there's about a 20 percent reduction i guess in the in the gelation time as we add this porphyrin to that gel as it's formed so let's just see how that happens then so this is a, a video of how this uh, formed let's just see if that works yeah so on the right there you can see the porphyrin solution in water remember that's a sodium salt and on the left hand side we've got a clear solution which contains the gelator molecule in ethanol and then now that's mixed really quickly you can see there the kind of the wavy lines as the water and ethanol are mixed and a few bubbles so it's slightly exothermic as well as that mixes uh, so then you just pop the lid on the top uh, to stop the ethanol evaporating leave it for a while and then that kind of opaqueness you can see there is the gel forming over time so at the end there that that now uh, is the gel that's formed and you can see that it's not forming at the interfaces it's really forming in the whole solution so it's quite a homogeneous material so that then contains fibers where we've got both um, the gelator molecule and the porphyrin molecule which is trapped in between those two uh, layers so just to focus here on the on the lower part of this image here this is a cartoon of what we're actually looking at so in fact what i didn't tell you was that the porphyrin molecule is actually there in a proportion that doesn't completely change the bromide counterions uh, that are there with the gelator. So we've got a combination of porphyrin molecules in between the layers and uh, bromide counterions. And we can look at how evenly these porphyrins are distributed within these layers using a uh, super resolution technique called total internal reflection fluorescence microscopy. So it's an optical technique uh, where you basically look at reflected um, fluorescence from the porphyrin molecule so we're not seeing the fibers of gelate here because these do not fluoresce at the wavelength we're looking at what we're looking at is the presence of the porphyrin molecules within that mixture so you can see these are done at different concentrations so this is a 12 micromolar and you can see there's a relatively uneven distribution in that sample there and relatively straight fibers as we increase the concentration so this is now 120 micro micromolar you're getting these kind of curvy lines here and i think the important thing to note here is that this is actually in the liquid so we're really seeing what's present in the gel form in between all of these uh, fibers here there is still ethanol and water uh, which is uh, quite nice to be able to to tell that really you are looking at the fiber structure there and as you increase the uh, concentration of tcp in the water when you add it even further uh, you get these kind of these branch structures coming off so you can influence the morphology as a function of the uh, concentration of tcpp that you that you use in terms of a property then what we were interested in with this uh, sample was actually to look at the generation of singlet oxygen singlet oxygen is a pretty useful uh, chemical species so it's useful for uh, photodynamic therapy where oxygen is used uh, for example to kill uh, cancer cells. It's also interesting in a uh, chemical synthesis sense because uh, when you generate um, singly oxygen or other reactive oxygen species, uh, those become a lot more reactive than the ground state triplet oxygen uh, and gets you to chemistry that you won't be able to get to another way. So uh, this just shows you uh, what's going on when you excite oxygen so what we're actually doing is transferring energy to the ground state of oxygen which i'm sure most of you know is a is a triplet state so we've got two unpaired radicals uh formerly either end of the uh, oxygen dioxygen molecule uh that's this state here when we transfer energy from something provided we're transferring the energy at the right place then we get to the uh lowest excited state of that which is the same bit where actually now the two electrons uh, are paired in the same orbital. There are other states, but this is the, the lowest energy state of those, and it's this one uh, that's reactive. And the way we're going to look at the reactivity of this single oxygen when we generate it is by the formation of a compound with this anthracene derivative here. So this middle bit of this molecule here is, is anthracene. An interesting characteristic of that is that when it's reacted with single oxygen, not with triplet oxygen it won't react very quickly with triplet oxygen but with singlet oxygen it reacts and the oxygen molecule adds across the middle of the molecule here so you can see the two oxygen atoms uh, are there uh, linking across these two carbon atoms and the driving force for that is the is the 
getting aromaticity in the flanking units there. So this is quite a nice system because when we add the oxygen across the middle of that molecule there, that stops the molecule being fluorescent. So this is actually uh, a very fluorescent molecule, as we'll see in a moment. When we add the oxygen across there, this molecule now is not fluorescent. So it's a really good uh, monitor of, of forming single oxygen. And we're actually using uh, the sodium salt well, of this compound here. So that's how we detect the single oxygen. So what we're doing, this is a cartoon, is our uh, two bilayers of our imidazolium uh, gelator molecule. Uh, we've got the porphyrin trapped both inside and the top, I should say, of this uh, gel. And this beam uh, indicates light coming in. It's going to excite the porphyrin, and the porphyrin is going to transfer its energy to the oxygen, make the single oxygen form, and then the single oxygen is going to go off and react with the anthracene compound. So first of all, to see the effect, let's just look at the porphyrin molecule in solution. So this is a uh, dissolved porphyrin molecule, no gelator present, and we're looking at the formation of single oxygen. This is the absorption spectrum of the porphyrin. Uh, so we're, we're exciting around here. Uh, and this is the reduction in fluorescence of that anthracene derivative that I showed you. So you can see that over around 30 minutes, there's a reduction of around 20% uh, in the fluorescence there. If we use the gel form now, uh, you can see this is the absorption spectrum. There's a lot more scattering, of course, as I showed you before, there's scattering with the gel. Uh, but, but this time, we're getting a 90% reduction of the fluorescence of the anthracene derivative here over the same time scale. So you can see that, that here, this gel material is far, far more effective at the generation of single oxygen uh, than the dissolved. So we're really getting a synergic effect of trapping the porphyrin in the gel fibers. That porphyrin being able to transfer its excited state energy into the oxygen and then carrying out that chemical reaction. Another thing we've done is to incorporate uh, drugs into the, uh, into the gels to do drug release. So that's another kind of application here. So uh, this is done in one-to-one uh, -one water ethanol. So the gel actually looks exactly the same as the gelator on its own, which is a good indication that the drug is really incorporated within the fibers. But this uh, material does release that particular drug very, very well. You can see this by this release profile here. Uh, the drug actually does uh, react. So this is actually degradation, is actually the reaction of that drug in the, in the medium. Uh, but you can see it's the released uh, before it starts to degrade significantly after 24 hours. So we're getting a really good release of that drug from this gel type material. And David Limon, who I hope he's listening, is, uh, did that work in Barcelona, so I, I thank him for that. A really nice thing about this system is that as you release the drug, the gel actually coils up. So you can see here, uh, I think Arancha did these uh, images. You can see here, they get the formation of these toroids, which are about 10 microns uh, in diameter which is because of some process which happens when you lose the drug from the gel fibers. And you can see these are all over the sample. And it's not just on the surface of the, of the sample. So you might think that it's just happening uh, at the top, but it's not because you can see fibers are over the top. You're getting the torus form even in the bulk of the material. And we think this is happening because when you release the drug, if you can imagine this uh, drug is cationic, I didn't point that out before, but it's cationic. So this can actually sit in the layers of the gelator. When that's removed, this gelator molecule now is in a, in a metastable state because it doesn't have all its space filled. So that can now rearrange and give you the interdigitated form, which is more stable uh, in, the, in the medium. And then that will generate uh, a tension in the bilayer, which will make it bend. And we think that's why the um, there's this kind of reorganization of the, of the gel fibers to form those toroids. So what we'd like to be able to do is to do that in a responsive way, ultimately to be able to do it reversibly, but let's start with a, a responsive way. So to take our gelator, to have a, a functional unit, which could, be the, um, which could be the drug or it could be something else, and then to have some kind of switch which we shine light on and then make uh, that 
um, system respond in some way, whether it's uh, mechanically or by the release uh, of a compound. So that's a supramolecular system, multi-component uh, in a solvent. Quite a complicated system, uh, but nonetheless quite interesting, I think. What I'm going to show you now, I'm not going to tell you what it is because I know this is being recorded and I don't want to give away the secret. We're going to send the paper soon, uh, but I don't want to give it away too much. You can guess this is this is the porphyrin inside because we're radiating at 405 nanometers. Uh, we've got a special ingredient here. I'm just going to give you a flavor of what can happen when we do that. So if we leave this in the microscope, you can see that those lines are disappearing there, right? So what's happening there is the porphyrin is moving along those fibers as we're irradiating in the sample, which doesn't happen when we only have the porphyrin there. So we've influenced the gel structure so that we've generated spaces where these porphyrins can move along. We've done experiments to show that, but they are actually lying outside the area uh, that we're irradiating here. I'll ju just let this run one more time. You can see porphyrins whizzing off all over the place as you watch that image. Yeah, there's lots of things going on in. So that was in one solvent mixture, one to one. And now let's see what happens in the seven to three solvent mixture. And now you can see it's completely different. Now things aren't disappearing. It looks like things are, are, are appearing, uh, but they're not. We're actually getting the formation of the toroids in this mixture here. So I'm gonna let that run through again. Uh, we started with fibers and now on this occasion, the solvent is influencing and now it's letting the fibers rearrange into these kind of toroid shapes. You can see here there's a toroid which is joining with another one and becoming bigger. So you can actually see how these micrometer sized toroids are forming over time. If you focus on this area down here, you can see how they grow. I'll just let that run by one more time. If you focus down here, it's really nice. If it'll go around again, yep, there you go. You start with fibers, goes around, forms a toroid, forms a bigger toroid. So there's some really interesting dynamic effects going on. Here. And that's the final state. Uh, just to show you two other things we're, uh, we're doing. So this is uh, actually, um, whoops, well, that video yeah, doesn't appear to be playing. I can't get it to go now. I'm running out of time anyway. If you'd like to see later, we've also done 3D printing on these materials. So uh, they're actually um, shear thinning type materials. So we can actually form 3D printed objects uh, by um, extrusion. And then just to end, I'd like to show you this um, material where we've taken a polyoxymetalate with adulator to get a hybrid material. So what you can see here is a SEM image. This now is not a gel, uh, but it, nonetheless, it's a nanostructure material, which is quite uh, interesting, where you get these kind of worm-like features in the SEM you can see here. And I think what's really fascinating is in the TEM images of these, you can see here, this is almost like a fingerprint where you can see lines within that region there. And those lines correspond to the uh, areas in between the lamellae of the gelator where you have the polyoxymetalate sitting. So you can see these all over the place. So you can see it here as well, here as well, here as well. So it's not an artifact of luck. This is happening all through the sample where you're organizing that polyoxymetalate. And you can actually use that to grow oxide material. So if we now calcine that oxide material, uh, you get to the uh, oxide form. And you can see here, there's a, a larger scale image, but if you go in really close, you can see you're getting some very fine uh, nanostructured oxide materials here by calcining uh, the gel, well, not gel, composite material that's nanostructured to get this kind of unique form. And you don't get that when you calcine, let's say, a tetrabutyl ammonium salt, that oxide. So it's really an influence of the structure of the starting hybrid that you get um, to make that kind of um, oxide material there that we're, we're interested in using it in batteries actually that material. Uh, just a reminder of you all uh, I'm on the uh, board of Chemical Society Reviews we've recently changed um, our lead here but that's to be announced yet uh, if any of you have got an idea for a Chemical Society Review please do get in contact to, with me by email. Um, I have to thank everyone involved in the work so this is the team that was involved with the, um, the cell reports um, paper on the porphyrin. Uh, there you can see the gel. Uh, this is Mario Samperi, who's now gone back to, uh, to Sicily, who did the bulk of the work there. there. David Limon, who was essential for the um, 
preparation of the porphyrin gels uh, to start with. And of course, UESA have been collaborating with for ages uh, on these imidazolium gels. Uh, Gleiser and George did most of the work on the uh, sorbitol derivatives. Uh, Rancha did some of the SAM, of course. Uh, Ricky and Sujin for the 3D printing. Uh, all of these people here for the uh, composite material. Nano Prime, who paid for TEM imaging, and the School of Life Sciencing Imaging Unit here in Nottingham, uh, which uh, helped us a lot in obtaining the high resolution images, optical images, uh, that I showed you in the dynamic effect. I'd like to thank my group. They're difficult times. We're all stuck at home still. We'll be getting back into the lab soon, uh, but I'd like to thank all of them. Uh, I only really spoke about Gleiser's work today, uh, but the other people are doing really interesting things that I hope to tell you about another time. Thank you all for listening, and I look forward to uh, hearing your questions. If you're still there. <laughs> it's really yeah, I, I, hope, I hope we're still here, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, David, for, for this nice seminar. Very nice images. <laughs> With the microscope. So yeah. I don't know if Xavier is here. Um, let's see. If not... Uh, well, if not, we, we have here one Please. first question. Yeah, Xavier? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. From Azar Shirazi, he says, good morning. Which software you use to create the molecule cartoons? The molecule cartoons? Yes. Uh, which probably, ones? I think we have I'm to I'm not sure. One, Maybe the, the molecule. Yeah, probably. Uh, that one. Um, I think these were actually done with um, Chem 3D, I would say. Yeah. Chem 3D. Chem 3D, yeah. Um, I didn't do that, Mario did it, obviously, <laughs> but I'd say that was done with, uh, with Chem 3D, yeah. Yeah, okay, I don't know if there are, yeah, he says thank you. Are there more questions? Maybe, Xavier, you have some questions? Yeah, uh, a moment. Yes, I have uh, maybe, David, one question which is uh, of a kind of a general uh, is it okay? You can put the camera. Yeah, I can hear. I can hear. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Ah, okay. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Now. Now it's okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I can see you. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Sorry, I was playing a little bit with all this stuff. Okay. So the for for me, which as you know, I'm not a chemist. I am always uh, extremely surprised when you try to navigate in such complex molecules and trying to generate a specific assembling and structures and so on. And I would like to ask you if you can comment about the capability of, uh, let's say, of the design and prediction on the structure or your own microstructure of these, of these uh, fibers and so on. Because uh, you mentioned sometimes some thermodynamic principles, but you didn't mention too much the, the kinetics of the of the FX, sometimes the regulation time and so on. How, how much you can play with the thermodynamics and the, let's say the kinetic effects in order to predict the, the structures and so at the end the functionality that you have mentioned on, on all these materials? No, I think it's a really interesting question. You're absolutely right. I mean, from the thermodynamic perspective, that's relatively easy, right? Because you know, you know what a thermodynamic minimum is gonna be in terms of a bilayer, like that one that's on the screen, right? So we know that, uh, but you're absolutely right. I mean, in fact, um, maybe I didn't say it so explicitly, but the kinetics are essential in the formation of, of this kind of structure here. So that's not something that you can predict a priori still, uh, but here you're clearly influencing in the, the size of the gel fibers. So you, um, you can empirically control the width and height of those aggregates. And I think maybe what's an interesting opportunity for, um, for oxide materials, let's say, uh, the thing that's really interesting is, is the bit I spoke about at the end. So in fact, we only looked at one, um, at one mixture of POM to gelator and ethanol to water in this case. Uh, and we get that kind of structure and then we calcine it to get this. But you could think of a whole combinatorial 
scope of different proportions of ethanol and water and proportions of POM to gelata uh, to access different size of, of platelets of that oxide material. So I, I think it's a really interesting opportunity and one which, you know, what's going on when you calcine that material, I don't think anyone really knows when you do that kind of thing, right, in the zeolites. I think it's, people know because of experience, but here we were at the, the start of something where we couldn't really predict what's going to happen there. And it's a, an interesting opportunity, definitely. Anna, I think we have other questions. Can you read them? Yeah, sure. So we have a question by David Kainbet or something like that. He says, hi, David. You showed interactions between carbon and hydrogen acetals and aromatic rings in the solid state. Could yeah. you observe that in solution? Variations of chemical shift by NMR? That's the first uh, question. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Um, I think, so let me just show what he's talking about there. Yeah, so he's talking about this interaction here. I don't believe in this case that we actually looked at that. So this is actually quite a nice system because it's in ethanol and water, so we can, uh, we can actually do NMR during the formation of the gel. I think in this particular case, it's an excellent point. We didn't actually look at that, and we should look at that for the for the DBS derivative. Um, we did do it for the imidazol derivatives, where you don't see such a let's say um, obvious kind of interaction between the molecules. Uh, but this is something. If Gleis is listening, this is something we we should definitely do for this family of compounds because obviously we can buy deuterated ethanol and water and and look at that assembly process so thank you very much for the suggestion it's a good point and he has a second question he says in the cartoons poly, uh, porphyrins sorry porphyrins yep. are not stacked is it just a drawing or have you run experiments to highlight they are isolated from one another yeah, it's another good question um, so you can actually see from the absorption spectrum whether the porphyrins are aggregated or not. So uh, you, you'll probably know if, if you know about porphyrins that the SORE band, which is this band here in the absorption, uh, can change that way or that way, depending on how they're aggregated and from the free form. And actually where we're seeing the absorption in the, in the gel fibers, that actually corresponds to the, to the free form. So not interacting in a kind of an H or J aggregate kind of way. So it, it really is this kind of scenario where it's, it's trapped in between. And really that's logical, I think, because the porphyrin's acting as a kind of a counterine to the midazolium. So we're really, that, that strong electrostatic interaction is stopping what's probably a weaker hydrophobic or, or pi-pi interaction uh, that might lead to some kind of aggregate. So um, I think there, the, the imidazolium is interacting so strongly with the carboxylate that it stops any further aggregation of the porphyrin. Mm -hmm. We have another question from Carlos. He says, finally, several gels are converted in crystals. W which is the mechanism to convert gels into crystals? Um, well, I'm not sure exactly what you mean, uh, but I'll, I'll try and answer. Uh, <laughs> with what I think you mean. <laughs> if not, you can, you can just come on. So these things actually look like crystals, right? And, and when you look at the powder diffraction, you see a powder diffraction peak. Um, but they're not really true crystals because they're very, very uh, thin, uh, as I showed you before. And although there's a high degree of order, I mean, I'm not going to get into a debate about what a crystal is, okay? <laughs> but they they are very, very uh, thin, so there's not a, a long kind of correlation distance in those, and that's especially true of the case of the DBS derivatives that I showed you before. I think a really interesting point that you raise is is kind of what happens when you dry a gel, because these are zero gels, uh, mm -hmm. as I pointed out earlier. So definitely gel fibers do come together as you dry the sample. That's uh, without doubt. But on the other hand, as you're drying, you don't really have a lot of mass transport. So you can't really imagine a kind of a classical kind of growth phenomenon taking place. It's more kind of crystals coming together to squeeze out solvent from between them. So I don't see that kind of process as being one way you would form uh, a very good crystal. You know, I think it's more of a, 
a non-specific aggregation that you form as you as you remove the solvent from the sample. Um, there are some cases where you form um, crystals within gels that you might know about. So that, that's not the case that we've done, but you can use gels to uh, crystallize other kind of materials. And the, the rationale behind that, I think, is to really slow down the mass transport within the gel. So there you, uh, you cool down, you trap the molecules in different parts, different compartments, let's say, in between the fibers, and then slowly they'll move through the fibers to form a crystal. So it's a way of forming good crystals. So that's used in protein crystallography, I think, quite a lot. But that's not the case that we're, we're doing here. Here we have a, a relatively rapid evaporation, and what we're getting is a non-ordered material. You can see within the plane here, it's totally random, the orientation of the fibers. Mm -hmm. I hope so, I answered with all of that. Mm -hmm. I hope so. We have, okay. we have another, another question, if I can read this, from yes. uh, Fabienne Dumoulin from yep. Turkey. Yeah. Uh, Hi, Fabienne. Hi, okay. <laughs> the, he says, Hi, uh, David and everybody, and thank you for the nice talk first uh, about the detection of SO by ATMA. Yeah. I have visited it, but. Uh, would be the presence of ATMA modify the structure of the gel? Okay, we let me just try and remember what we did here. So, uh, what Fabian is saying is, let me just go to it. Well, let me look at this picture. This is nice. So, if you remember, the, the ADMA is also uh, is an anion as well. So, in principle, you could think that this would also attach to the gel fibers. So we don't think that's in influencing Fabian because we did the experiment where we take uh, the gel on its own and even with the porphyrin and then expose it to the ADMA in solution. And if that was having a big influence, we'd expect the ADMA to absorb non-specifically to the, to the gel fibers and we get a drop in the fluorescence that we were seeing from solution and we don't see that. So we think that that is not an important influence in the in the system. Could it contribute? Undoubtedly, it could contribute because um, obviously this is a, a polycation, and we could think that the admiral would kind of come in and off the surface, and that would get your single oxygen closer to the admiral and make it react, and that could be a catalytic effect in the system. But we've seen no evidence to show that the admiral is really adhering there. So I think that would be my, my answer to that question. Is that okay? Great. <laughs> okay, we have uh, quite a lot of questions. Can you read from the map? We have, I think, from uh, Mariano Campoy. Yeah, uh, Mariano Campoy says, uh, fantastic talk, David, thanks. thanks is, there any, is, is there any possibility to have fully conjugated gelators? Uh, yeah, yeah, there are for sure. I mean, um, let me just think of some examples. I don't think I have any here, but uh, for sure there's plenty of uh, conducting polymer materials um, that you're probably familiar with that form uh, that form gels. There's several uh, diketoperolipyrrole derivatives that form gels as well. So yes, there are. I think the difficulty is predicting um, what the gel would. Uh, whether the gel would form or not, because that's still not really predictable. You know, we get some rough ideas about how that can happen, but it's still very much a, a dark art, really. So um, we can we can stick certain functional groups on and, and help that happen uh, for sure. But 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 you can. So I mean, the work we did together, Mariana, on the uh, on the conducting material. I mean, that um, is one. Uh, where you do see a great influence on the conductivity of uh, the material. So, you know, gelators are an interesting route in terms of getting kind of long range 1D order, let's say, or even 2D order, uh, mm -hmm. where you don't necessarily have a bulk 3D order. So um, that's one of the reasons we're interested with them. So um, definitely you can, can do that, but there, is, there are still challenges, you know, but it's, it's something that's possible and is, is really interesting. And there are, of course, lots of other people all around the world working in that area as well have done some lovely work who I didn't mention, but um, yeah, yeah it, it's definitely possible. Yeah, and related to that, he says, if, if there is, a, um, which is the minimum diameter that could be achieved? I don't know. 
minimum diameter so yeah that's that's a really interesting question i think one of the things which surprised us about this gel system was that we in the afm we uh i don't know if you recall with the nine to one solvent mixture we actually showed kind of this kind of structure where we just had two bilayers one on top of the other uh which i think is a really interesting opportunity in terms of nanoscience you know to be able to to do that i don't think it's something people have looked at an awful lot um but definitely in terms of, of this dimension kind of the height of those fibers you can get to kind of well we've shown one or two uh by layers normally it would be a few more uh the width is a lot more difficult to control i would say because of the growth process uh but there are fibers that are that are very very narrow as well so you can influence it we've shown that with uh with temperature or with solvent composition so the typical kind of things you do for a bulk heterojunction as well um influencing influencing those things and the growth rates yeah thanks for the question we have another one from philip sandiumenja uh, he says, first, okay. sorry for being a complete outsider. Mm -hmm. When I see those long fibers, I wonder how should I figure them out? Are they elastically deformed single crystals? Or alternatively, what kind of plastic deformation is going on there? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a great question, right? Um, mm -hmm. So if you look at this kind of fiber image, for example, which I'm sure is what, what Philippe is thinking about, right? So those fibers, are actually extremely elastic so there's a lot of work now actually Philippe um, I mean I know it's not not your area exactly but in the area of organic crystals plastic organic crystals there's an awful lot of work going on um, so they can deform when we look at the rheology what we're doing is actually breaking fibers as well but um, in the case of of the 3d printing example what you can do is actually break those fibers you can deform them they bend because they're very very thin if you see and then they can actually reform as well so you kind of get self-healing phenomena going on as well but that depends on the kind of gelator and the kind of solvent as well so i think you're right it is a kind of a plastic deformation uh, in the fibers that you're seeing and especially um thank you for the question because it, it it gets me into those kind of toroid formations as well that you see that definitely seems like a kind of a plastic deformation right where you get the the layers flowing over each other and bending around so um that that's a really interesting point with regards to the mechanism of formation of those thank you another question um from nisar ahmed he's he says okay. thank you very much for the nice presentation what will be the effect of the counter anion? Which anion favors gelation more? Yeah, another great question as well. So, um, well, it depends on the solvent, of course, that we're in. We haven't messed around too much with bromide or chloride because they're really quite similar. So, bromide or chloride have similar gelation properties. We work with the bromide just because uh, synthetically it's, it's just easier to do and we know the characteristics of that material and you can see there's a, there's a lot of things we can do with that of course when we when we make these kind of hybrid materials we are actually doing a counter ion exchange so this example here uh, with the porphyrin uh, is a good case in point so we can only go up to a certain loading of this porphyrin in the water ethanol mixture because if we if we take the concentration of the porphyrin too high that then becomes uh, a powder amorphous material. So it just seems to precipitate completely. So to get the formation of a gel, you're really at kind of the crossover point between something being a solution and something being a bulk solid. So we want uh, growth in one direction, which is what we see, the formation of fibers, but we don't want the three-dimensional growth. So if you imagine that we have a porphyrin on top of this layer here, that's going to be hydrophobic and you're going to start to get three-dimensional growth rather than one-dimensional growth so that's the influence that it has really and as soon as you change the the, the counter ion you really have to look at completely different solvent systems because your rate of of growth along the fiber length and the width of course and three-dimensional growth changes so it definitely changes a lot um we got quite happy with bromide and chloride at the moment it worked it works pretty well uh for what we're doing but there might be other cases where 
you know, a, a different kind of account time would be, would be really useful. It's definitely something that's interesting to play with. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. A uh, question from Steve Chang. Sorry, he was he had nice. put it on the chat. He says, yeah. "Very nice talk. Have you seen any examples of colloidal gel instead of fiber gel by using small molecule gelator? For example, is there a possibility to form amorphous spheres?" Thank you. There are people looking at that kind of thing. It's not something we've seen. So one thing you'll notice is that a lot of um, gel molecules in general tend to be, well, look like liquid crystals, let's say. They're kind of calamitic, long rod-shaped things that are going to come together and form a melee. So we actually had a case of uh, a, a kind of a disc-like molecule, which in principle wouldn't do the same kind of thing because you could get growth um, kind of in the plane of these stacks. You could get growth in all three dimensions. And we had a kind of a strange morphology out of that, which we never really understood. Um, you can get gels from, from that kind of morphology, but really the main one that you see out there is, is from um, calamitic type molecules. So it's an interesting area to go into actually. If you're looking for a research area to go into, there's, there's a lot of space in there in, in molecular systems, but very tough I have to say, because um, people have tried to form gels a lot of ways, and uh, I'm not aware of that many examples of that kind of thing. Okay, a question from, from Carmen Ocal. Yeah, okay. uh, <laughs> She says, thanks for the nice talk, David. A pleasure as always listening to you. Uh, I am curious about the toroidal formation. Given the interpretation in terms of tension along the fibers as you draw it, I would expect as well, or even more favorable, the formation of spirals. Do you observe this type of formation? Yeah, that's an interesting point. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, let me just get to the slide that Carmen's talking about. Yeah. I think the answer is yes, we would expect it, but no, we don't see it. <laughs> so this, this, this seems to be uh, a more favorable case in terms of the growth. It's a really interesting point you, you raised because you could think that this would just spiral down into the into the into the plane right you do see something in this image which is twisted like almost a figure eight right there so there is is that kind of formation of that kind of thing uh but in terms of the i guess the interface energy of the system the toroid will be more favored because if you have a spiral case you have a lot more contact in between the faces of the fibers and the surrounding solvent when it's growing. So I'm guessing that the toroid case would be more favorable than the elongated case. And that kind of points to the fact that it's a semi-reversible process at least. Because in if, if, if I think of, of, of my small molecule chemistry training, we're always taught that, that if you have an equilibrium, a macrocycle is more favorable than a very long thing. Uh, in thermodynamic terms because everything is used in in binding to other things uh, and that would be the case of, of the toroid here but it's a case it's a point that's really well made actually um, it's interesting that when they bend they do seem to find each other's ends which seems to imply that they bend in a plane which is odd um, it's what we observe it's interesting you uh, so what would that mean I'm thinking on my feet here and what that would mean is that you, you bend in the long plane of the, of the fiber, so it would bend up rather than twisting. So you're not, you, you're generating a tension across that plane uh, rather, than the, the, rather than a diagonal plane, if you see what you mean. To get a twist, you'd have to generate a tension. Uh, let me just go back a second. I'm gonna go back to the fiber, excuse me a second. Mm -hmm one will do yeah so what i'm saying is you get a tension generated along here which is bigger than across because if, if it was across you'd form a cylinder right if you had a tension across here it would form a cylinder we have a tension along here which forms the toroid if you had a diagonal tension that would then generate your spiral but we don't get that so we it's really this tension here which is the longest one that you have and i guess that then is what's forming the toroid here so that would be my answer Thanks, Carmen. Nice. 
A uh, question from Dino Tonti. Yeah. Uh, he says, hi David, if ethanol is able to make such structures with water, would you regard it as a surfactant also for interaction with solid molecules? Uh, yeah, I mean, it definitely is a, is a kind of surfactant in the sense that it modifies the surface tension, right? So it is. So what, what these guys showed by theory uh, is that, you know, I, I can't remember what portion of, of water and ethanol this is, but, but you can see in the picture that the ethanol, just visually, there's a lot more ethanol at the interfaces than there is in the bulk of the solvent where there's a lot more water. So you definitely consider it as a kind of a, of a surfactant, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I think it's the last question from Arancha González. Uh, she says, thanks David for the nice talk and impressive works. I have a question regarding the benzylidine disorbital fibers. Yeah. What about the chirality of the fibers with chiral solvents? Who directs the chirality of the fiber? Right, yeah, so Arancha, thanks for the question. Um, they're actually mainly flat. There's only one solvent we see uh, helical fibers in, which I think is cyclohexane, if I remember well. Uh, and even then, the fibers are mainly flat. So the um, the process is really driven by this kind of interdigitation here. So you'll know that when you have a chiral molecule, you don't necessarily get a chiral morphology uh, in what, whatever you're making. Um, so here the driving force, I would say, is this kind of lateral interaction, which is basically flat. So this crystal structure, I think it has a C2 rotation in it, if I remember well. So that, that normally gets you into a, into a flat kind of lamella type regime. So that's why we don't see the twisting here. It was something we would have liked to have seen, but something, something we don't. Uh, so maybe if we, if we change the design of the molecule a bit, a bit we'll, we'll see that by influencing this interaction, maybe getting a twist. Uh, but we're not there there yet with that. So thanks for the question anyway. Okay. I think we have we have written uh, we have read all the questions. If right. not, just, Good. just write and them on the chat. I can I can do a, a final question, David. <laughs> yeah, of course, Javier. Yeah. Sure. yeah, of course, it's so a, a very general one. So I would like that you make a comment about the the possibility that such a system where you have uh, some. Uh, or multi-parameter control of the formation and so on. If there are tools, for, uh, let's say, high throughput screening uh, production and the corresponding uh, in situ analysis of the fiber formation and so on. So how I know that in other fields there is a lot of effort to, to combine these two things. Uh, is this also some kind of capabilities for soft matter to to do this to combine, I know, but it's synchrotons, optical, or whatever techniques to, to analyze the, the fast uh, the, the formation of different parameters or any combinatorial uh, approach or something like this. Yeah, I think this is a really good point, and it's some, somewhere we need to go, really. So um, we, we did actually talk about it for the formation of the gels, you know, where we're looking at the, basically we're looking at the, uh, turbidity of the solution there actually so you could really think of a high throughput uh, route to do that um, I think that's a really interesting opportunity and to screen the kind of thermodynamic space of those systems to do that that's that's a really interesting uh, possibility it's not something we've explored but it's you know you could easily think of a, a setup where you could um, where you could mix samples I mean you need good mixing but you, you can think of a ways to do that and look at the development of the turbidity of those solutions um, in a high throughput way. I think in terms of the materials, uh, the POM example, um, yeah, definitely you could think of, of doing multiple combinations of POM and gelated kind of molecules and even, you know, putting different additives in with the gelator system. Um, again, not something we've done, but something that, that would be really important for the um, for the development of the oxide kind of materials around there. So it's it's relatively easy to prepare those zero gels uh, relatively quickly. Um, yeah, so you might have might have given us a good idea there in terms of the oxide materials there to be able to do that because we could screen them with with electron microscopy actually. So just putting them on a slide. 
and then going across the side and looking at each point on the morphology that that would be quite a nice thing to do actually yeah thanks very much okay okay so i think anna we have finished so let me just say a few words uh, to all the people who has been listening to you and uh, of course david thank you very much you make uh, uh, as uh, usual a magister talk okay so a lot of people appreciate it as you see not only of from igmap but also uh, the advantage of uh, not being in barcelona is that people from uh, other countries have also been listening to you yeah. of course good but uh, we still have the possibility to to guess the taste of whiskey of this uh, sulfurated <laughs> uh, flavor and hopefully we'll have the possibility to, to do it in, in real world uh, sometime in barcelona yeah i hope so yeah thank <laughs> you very much and uh, you know, Anna, you want to add something else? Yeah, only thank you all for all the questions and for attending the seminar. The seminar is being recorded, so we, we, we will also put it in our YouTube channel during this week, probably. So you will also be able to see it there. Thank you, David. I hope to see you soon at the IGMAP someday. Yeah. And thank you, Joanna and Xavier, for being here. Okay. Too. Okay. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye bye. Everybody. Have a good thank one. You, David. Bye. See you. Thank you. Thank you.